Programs should be made from the ground up by starting with a list of the important variables and a firm understanding of how they work together and moving forward by logical decisions that manifest that understanding. They shouldn't come about the way a teenager makes a suicide at 7-Eleven. So guys, I'm finally getting around to reviewing n 531. I put this off for a long time, honestly, because it seemed kind of daunting. Every time I'd click on the spreadsheet to go over the numbers, there was just a lot of different numbers and there wasn't a clear cut obvious progression and it just seemed like a lot. And I'm like, do we really need another review of a 531 variation? I had gotten tired of reviewing Wendler's variations to 531 that kept him putting out sequels to the book. So it wasn't a high priority, but I was scrolling down through Boost Camp, checking how all of the different programs were ranking. Strongly recommend you check out Boost Camp. It's free to use. I have a bunch of programs on there but they have a lot of popular programs and Ensons was at the top. There were a lot of people running it. So I thought, okay, this merits some attention. So I committed to putting together a review, breaking down what makes it tick, giving you guys my two cents on the program, thumbs up, thumbs down, should you run it, should you run away. Now in doing some research and trying to get to the bottom of this thing, one of the first websites I came to that summarized the Ensons program started out by saying, this is a program inspired by two popular programs, 531, and Shaco. Oh boy, we are already off to a rough start. I already had this kind of surface level impression of the program that it was unnecessarily convoluted. And then seeing that it is the hybrid, the mashup of two different programs, which are very different from each other. It only confirmed that suspicion that it wasn't some like 4D chess that solved a problem and created some new interesting approach to training and that it was actually just kind of a mishmash of different parts, like a kid mashing together parts of different action figures. This program reminds me of the South Park episode, An Elephant Makes Love to a Pig. Like, yeah, the elephant and pig make love and there's some viable offspring, but was it necessary? Did we ask for it? Like, is this furthering evolution or is this like an affront to God? Because Ensons relies so heavily on 531 and Shaco, and because so much of what I have to say about Ensons is based on the differences between those two programs and how Ensons adapts it into one program, I can't even talk about it without first going over these two. So real quick, let's do a breakdown of these programs. We'll go over what makes them tick and then we'll get into Ensons and decide whether or not it did a good job of melding these two things into a new pig elephant creature. If you guys haven't heard, I am officially a Barbell Apparel sponsored athlete. I get real giddy every time I see the term athlete next to my name, like you're playing real fast and loose with that word, but I'm super excited to be part of the team. You will only see me in barbell apparel clothing from now on because it is the most comfortable gear out there. All I've worn up until now is old contest t-shirts and basketball shorts from 2007. This stuff is like next level. It's like Lululemon, but without the affront to your masculinity. So if you haven't already, check out Barbell Apparel. You will not regret it. So first up, we got 531. I've done videos on 531. You're free to check those out. The beauty of 531 is the simplicity. This is a linear progression type program that's made for casual recreational lifters. It's minimalist. It can be applied to a lot of people with success. It does a lot of things to make sure that more people can get more out of it. It's not so focused on one particular niche. Now, the way it does that is by being very broad. Every time you put a program out, if you want it to apply to a lot of people, it has to be very broad. The more changes you make, the more you try to get more out of frequency or more out of effort and intensity, the more individual variations makes it hard to predict how it's going to go down. So that's usually reserved for when you're coaching somebody, working one-on-one -on -one so you can get feedback and adjust as you go. 531 can be written on a cocktail napkin. You don't even need the book. You don't even need most of the articles on it. Basically the big four, squat, bench, deadlift, overhead press are each done once per week. There is not a lot of accessory recommended. Wendler gives a lot of variations, but it's usually just a couple of exercises done for a variety of set and rep schemes. Week one, five reps or more. Week two, three reps or more. Week three, one rep or more. Those are all AMRAP sets. Wendler gives percentages for the sets ramping up, but calculating those is a giant waste of time. It doesn't matter for the workout. Those are all just sub-maximal warm-up sets leading to your AMRAP. So we start at 85%. Now, that's actually closer to 75% because he recommends you take 90% of a training max. So you're starting off light. This AMRAP at this percentage for week one, it's gonna be double digits, easily 10 to 12 reps. And then week two, it's gonna be six to eight reps. Week three, it's gonna be four to six reps. 
And the way it works is that every three weeks, you repeat the cycle, adding five pounds. Now it's a linear progression in that the amount of work stays static and all you're doing is adding five pounds to the workload on a regular interval. Now the main difference between this and something like starting strength or Grayskull is that those progress the weight every session or every week. This progresses the weight every three weeks. This jump in the three week wave isn't the actual progression. You can look at those as distinct training sessions in a different threshold. The actual progression comes when you repeat that whole thing five pounds heavier. So the rate of progression is very slow. And that's one of those things I was talking about that's necessary when you're trying to get it to apply to a lot of people. Erring on the side of slow, steady, predictable progress, setting it to a clock, just getting in the work, adding the weight when you're supposed to, and then letting the progressive overload do the work. So I already know that I'm gonna get a bunch of comments from 531 followers because I did on every other video I put out. I know that I didn't get into detail on the deloads or all of the different accessory variations or what Jim talks about in Beyond 531. I don't care about that. This isn't a video about 531. This is just the gist of what makes the program what it is and who it's appropriate for. So we can compare these two and give an educated decision on whether or not NSUNS makes any sense at all. So comparing this with Shaco, we have the complete opposite. First of all, this is a high frequency program. Now this is an example. This is a three day example. Many Shaco programs are four or even five days. You're blending upper and lower body. And he really likes this structure where you do a lift, then you do the opposite lift. So bench into squat, and then you go right back to benching. He has you do that a lot. Really neat way to sneak in volume. It's extremely taxing. Uh, even the percentages are very, very submaximal. The way you handle all of this, this isn't a progression over weeks. This is one week of work right here. So the way you handle all of these reps is by keeping the work very light. RIR is, is pretty high. You're keeping three, four, five reps in the tank. And what the program hinges on is adapting you to the frequency. So it treats these lifts as a skill. It's essentially Olympic lifting applied to powerlifting. So you get the benefit of refining skill by doing all these movements and variations that are very similar to the competition lifts. The amount of work you do is the adaptive stress that causes you to grow. And the whole thing follows a periodized structure where the author is keeping track of all of the mathematics behind this. You have to look under the hood. You have to look at number of lifts and average intensity. You have to be constantly weighing volume and the variations and exactly how they're mix and match to like allow recovery while still keeping the stress high enough to grow. There is a lot that goes into the progression. Every program's different. There is no one Shaco template. This is really just an approach, this is an arrangement of preferences that Shaco likes to put into his program. So you can look at the program and see the influence. If you see high frequency, if you see the lifts repeating the same workout, if you see a lot of work on the way up, pyramiding up and then pyramiding back down, if you see, he likes these, a lot of jumbled reps. Shaco is actually really big on load variation which is useful. It keeps you psychologically engaged in what you're doing. It also allows a type of recovery. If you keep the percentage the same, like right here at 70%, he has you go two, four, six, seven, five, three. That's a really interesting way to mix up the reps. And what you find is that for the amount of work you do at that weight, you actually get a bit more quality and speed and confidence because of the way you're bouncing around on the uh, on the rep count. And there's also a big emphasis on submax work. The 50, 60, 70% for like fives, fours, threes, that's nothing. That's very low RPE. But because there is so much of it over all of these exercises, it's still relevant in the weekly volume. So when you go into a heavier phase and you start peeling away work at that range, there's actually a very viable recovery effect that happens. So that type of, of volume, that type of work is still relevant when it comes to calculating the amount of work, the amount of stress that you're experiencing in this program run. So we can summarize 531, very low volume, relies on one heavy all out set on the main lift to drive progress. You just glue yourself to that three week wave, add reps when it's appropriate. The fact that the linear progression is stretched out beyond three weeks makes it more sustainable for more people, stronger, more advanced athletes can handle it. And because it's simple enough to be summarized on a cocktail napkin, it's idiot proof. It's not hard to understand. You always know where you're at with your training. It's very easy. It's training on autopilot. Going to Shaco, we have something that is much more focused for power lifters specifically, much more emphasis on skill work, repeating sets done repeatedly in the session and throughout the week. 
Everything is submaxed. There are no AMRAPs here. There are no max effort sets here. It is the accumulation of the skill work that drives progress and the way it progresses very complex because it's entirely individual. But even the programs that people run from Shaco, the man himself said he didn't mean for people to run them. They were examples that popped up in his book. They weren't made specifically to take into account what the average population needed in terms of a training stimulus. And how you move forward through each phase of the periodization cycle, it's not on a set timeline where you're simply adding weight each time because you can't. You can't do that with this amount of work. Progressing on a Shaco program involves adapting to the amount of work and then eventually going into a more strength focused phase where you're reducing the amount of work and chasing higher percentages. So the programs rely on variables that are inversely related, where like if one is high, the other has to be low. So if Shaco is a high volume program, that means intensity has to be low, not only in the percentage, but in the actual effort that you're putting out. Well, 531 is based around putting out essentially maximal effort on the AMRAP sets. So right off the bat, I'm very skeptical that these two programs have any business being written on the same sheet. So let's take everything we talked about here. Let's go look at the NSUNS template and let's see what we see. All right, so let's see what we've got here. So first of all, in reading the spreadsheet, know that there aren't multiple weeks. This is a linear progression. So they give you the first week of work, they give you the rules on how to increase weight, and then that just goes on indefinitely. The five day is kind of the base version, and then there's a four day and six day. Now the four and six day variations aren't like creative ways to try to put the same amount of work into a different split. It's literally just adding or subtracting a day of work. So the five day split, there's three pressing days, there's two lower body days. If you go to the four day, you're just dropping an upper body day. So the amount of lower body work stays the same. You're cutting upper body work by a third. Similarly for the six day, you're just adding another lower body day. So each day appears to start with the five, three, one progression. If you set the training maxes to 100, 95 for one or more. So that's the third week of the five, three, one wave, but it's only the third week. And it's that week done back to back to back. Also, you're not just adding five pounds, it's auto-regulated. So you add weight based on how you did on the AMRAP. So if you only get a couple of reps, you don't change the weight. If you get more reps, you take bigger jumps. So it's auto-regulated. That's an entirely new feature. That's not part of 531 or Shaco. Now, after you do that, where Wendler might have you do boring but big or do a couple of accessory exercises, in this program, you are staying put and you are doing more work on the way down. And every workout has a jumbled rep scheme. And that shows the inspiration from Shaco where, you know, some days you're just pyramiding down. Some days you're doing jumbled reps. And even on some days you're dropping way down to like 65% and doing an AMRAP. Now, the thing that stands out here is the amount of work, but it's the amount of work paired with the AMRAP sets, which have very, very high effort associated with them, which have a big recovery cost, but also with the rate of progression that is very aggressive and continuous. It isn't spread out. It's week to week. And you're not just increasing what you do on the AMRAP set, you're increasing your training max, which will increase everything you do on every set. Very high volume workouts, you're limited on how aggressively you can increase because even a five pound jump taken across a lot of sets and reps is a big jump in volume and that catches up with you. So especially if you're doing that without applying the periodization that Shaco leans on, you're gonna run into a problem. You can't handle really high volume training like this without incorporating some form of periodization that has some ebb and flow of training stress so that you can recover. Very new lifters can get away with this just fine, but newer lifters don't require the amount of complexity that this program has. And similarly, intermediate lifters likely aren't going to be able to handle this for very long. I'm actually a big fan of both of these styles of training. I've used 531 type programs that are very minimalist, low volume, low frequency, and I've had a ton of success. I've also done the exact opposite. When I was in the middle of contest prep, when I needed more skill work, when I was doing more touches throughout the week, I was revisiting the same exercise over and over. I was doing a lot of volume and that also worked very well. The thing is, it's not about one workout or one program being better than the other. It's about the way that they're different and how you have to run each one in order to get the most out of it. Only when you really understand, have a handle on that, are you really justified in making tweaks to the program. So I think my... Initial concern was justified. I mean, at first glance, it looked like these programs go together about as well as mustard and birthday cake. And my initial thought was that this was the kind of melding of two ideas that you see as part of the normal process of learning 
Like early creativity in children involves taking two things that they're already familiar with and smashing them together. And it's not until you get more mastery of the subjects you're trying to represent and you've had thousands of hours of practice with these mashups that you're actually capable of creating something that's new, interesting, or useful. And this style of discovery is great when you're writing fiction or when you're learning to paint, but for systems that exist to produce predictable outcomes, not so much. Any discipline that concerns itself with the physical world, medicine, architecture, martial arts, lifting weights, learning happens by copying what the best do until you have mastered the fundamentals. And it's only when those fundamentals have been ingrained into your brain that you're really justified in stepping out of bounds and trying something new. And he also says in the post, I'm not an expert in lifting. And I appreciate the honesty and the disclaimer. He's being upfront, but it does beg the question. If you're not an expert in lifting, why are you trying to engage in program crafting and spreading that to other people who are also not experts in lifting? Now, for as critical as I am, I can't dog the OP too hard. He's part of an online community where everyone shares their experiences in an attempt to learn and grow and accelerate the learning process. And lifting specifically uses a pretty informal approach to this since so many things tend to work and it's really just adherence to the big things that tend to pay off early on. The problem is that in trying to meld two existing things together without having a firm handle on why they work the way they do, we end up with a convoluted monstrosity that appears to feature the worst of all worlds. The simplicity of 531 that made it easy for casual lifters to progress has been swapped out for the randomized number soup that is Shaco programs. And it's a level of complexity that really just isn't warranted for the type of lifter that's running it. Even if that amount of complexity is warranted, the program doesn't move forward in a way that makes it sustainable. And now the volume and frequency of Shaco that requires modulated intensity with carefully selected working weights, it's now at odds with the AMRAP sets and the linear progression that aims to increase weight with them every single week. It tries to be high intensity and high frequency and high volume. And the thing is that this bowling ball of adaptive stress does cause growth. You can definitely take a just do all the work, do all the things type approach and grow for a period of time. You can look at programs like Smolov and Bulgarian that treated lifters as disposable and threw them like eggs against the wall. And the ones that don't crack are the ones that reap all the rewards. But when you're trying to give a program to the masses, the lifters aren't disposable. You're trying to do as much good for as many of them as you can. And if a program isn't sustainable, you're not going to reach that end. Causing enough stress to grow is just half the battle. And it's actually the easiest one. Appropriately pacing volume and intensity with the rate of progression and the frequency of rest periods especially with a program aimed at a broad audience, that's the hard part. 531 addressed that issue, as did Shaco and his templates, but Ensuns takes those solutions and disposes them in the name of just creating something new. Programs should be made from the ground up by starting with a list of the important variables and a firm understanding of how they work together and moving forward by logical decisions that manifest that understanding. They shouldn't come about the way a teenager makes a suicide at 7-Eleven. So that's my take on Ensuns. There's no doubt in my mind that people have ran it with success, that people have gotten stronger by doing it. It is a lot of work. And if you survive it, if you stay in one piece, if you don't get over use issues, if you don't run into a wall, you likely will progress. I would prefer to see something like that as a discrete standalone, like three or four week block that is designed to overreach you aggressively before transitioning to something else. But that doesn't seem built into the program. And I think that's where people are going to run into problems. If I seem a little critical of Ensigns, I mean, that's just part of trying to maintain standards in any academic discipline. We're trying to uphold standards and best practices, and that requires being skeptical and double checking people's work. So let me know what you guys think. Did you run it? Did you have a good experience with it? Did you get eaten up by it? Let me know what you think in the comments or better yet, take it to Patreon where you can get in touch with me personally. If you have a question, a comment, if you have an idea for a video, that's also where you can see me upload videos of my training with commentary so you can see how I put these principles into practice in real time. Thanks so much, guys. Don't forget to check out Kong on Boost Camp. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.